Hello and welcome. It's been a week that's seen Israel and Hezbollah step closer to all-out war. Airstrikes across Lebanon on Monday, killing more than 500 people, the deadliest day in the country since civil war more than three decades ago. Hezbollah struck deeper into Israeli territory. And the chief of the IDF told soldiers to prepare for possible entry of ground troops into the south and explosions in Beirut on Friday. Unified calls came for a 21-day ceasefire from the UN and Western allies, but the rhetoric of the Israeli PM suggests anything but peace. My policy, our policy is clear. We are continuing to strike Hezbollah with full force. It's been a week that's seen several defendants testify in the mass rape case of Giselle Pellico. Her ex-husband, Dominique, has already admitted organising the sedation and rape of his wife by strangers over a period of 10 years. A horrifying case that's had a ripple effect across France and beyond in a case that would have stayed behind closed doors if it wasn't for the strength, courage and dignity of Giselle Pellico deciding to lift her right to anonymity. We look at how she's become a national and global symbol in the fight against sexual violence. Qu'est-ce que vous ressentez quand vous voyez ces femmes Beaucoup d'émotions, monsieur. And it's been a week where both sides of the channel have seen their new government setting out their stalls. Here in France, after a left-wing victory and two months of uncertainty with a right-wing minority government now in power, the new Conservative Interior Minister this week setting out three priorities. The first, re-establish order. The second, re-establish order. The third, re-establish order. Meanwhile, in Britain, conference speech time for the centre-left Prime Minister, nicknamed Free Gear, Keir, in the press this week for accepting donor gifts of clothing, VIB football tickets, then this terrible faux pas, a sausage gaffe while talking about Israel. I call again for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The return of the sausages, the hostages. Welcome to The World This Week with me. And from the International Press Corps this week, we have Elizabeth Pino, political correspondent for Reuters. Elizabeth, hello. Good evening. Tell me what you've been working on this week. What I've been working on this yes. week? Yes, you've been following the, closely the politics yes, of the French government. Yes, the new government. government, indeed. I was there. I was uh, at the first cabinet meeting on Monday. It lasted 28 minutes. And then I was at the National Assembly, where everybody's rather worried. And I will be at the National Assembly next Tuesday to listen to the first big speech of our new Prime Minister, Michel Barnier. OK, we're going to get on to that. Great to have you here, Elisabeth. Also, the seasoned international correspondent and independent journalist, Anne Bagamarie. Anne, what has caught your attention this week? Well, I've been watching the Pellico case pretty closely for a couple of clients in the US who are interested in, in this, French, this very French and very unusual um, uh, case that is unfolding in the public eye. I've also been looking a lot at Israel because there's a story there that I covered for um, the American Lawyer magazine and Law.com International. It's reared its head, and that is judicial reform. Believe it or not, coming up in the middle of everything that's going on in Israel. It's, it's, it's quite a window onto the Netanyahu government. Perhaps we'll talk about it later. It kind of seems haute fois, like another time. But all the protests on the streets about judicial reform, which turned into protests about the conflicts, we'll get onto that. Okay. Let's go to the UK. Judah Grunstein, Editor-in-Chief of World Politics Review in Newcastle. Hi, Judah. What has dominated the week for you story-wise? Hi there. Thanks for having me. Uh, we've been working on uh, a lot of different stuff, but two stories that catch my eye are the upcoming presidential election or election in Tunisia and the leadership election uh, that took place today in Japan. Yes, with the, with the incoming uh, Prime Minister being sworn in, a story that easily gets hidden amidst the, the developing breaking news from Jerusalem and from Lebanon today. To Jerusalem, France 24's Iris Makler on another week where we're seeing Iris a critical moment in the Middle East. It is a critical moment in the Middle East. You know, the scale of this attack tonight in the Dahya in southern Beirut, uh, the reports, contradictory reports, but the reports, nevertheless, that Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, uh, the commander in chief of Hezbollah, could have been either injured or killed or saved. But nevertheless, that that is the focus. The size of the bomb, um, from what I've been reading here, meant to be the largest bomb, a bunker buster, uh, US technology, Israeli technology, but it um, goes well under the ground, wasn't used in Gaza. So it's the largest um, 
It's the largest bomb used during, during this whole war. And if Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah is injured or killed, it's a game changer. To which, as we're live, the effects that we are seeing on the ground are still to be determined. The Israelis are saying that they were targeting the Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah, which takes us to this week. On Wednesday evening, New York, world leaders meeting at the UN General Assembly, the US and here in France, the French government announcing a joint proposal they're working on to try to stop an all-out war in Lebanon between Israel and Hezbollah, one that would involve a 21-day ceasefire in order to negotiate a return to peace. A dozen Western allies issuing a joint statement with the same plea to warring parties. On the same evening, the chief of Israel's military telling the troops to prepare for a possible ground offensive. And this week's sequence of events continuing from where last week ended. The IDF dismantling Hezbollah's communication structure, carrying out mass detonation of pages, then backup walkie-talkie devices, killing dozens, injuring thousands, assassinating two, its elite commando unit chief. Then on Monday, the biggest campaign of IDF strikes since the war in 2006, more than 500 killed. And fast forward to Friday, where we have this bombing of Beirut. Now, in the meantime, the Prime Minister is in New York at the UN meeting as of Friday, where would he heed the calls of his allies, unlike previous times, regarding the crossing of US red lines, which were moved, which were passed. Let's have a listen to what Benjamin Netanyahu had to say at the UN. In order... Order, please. During the flight, I gave approval for the elimination of the head of the UAV unit and other things, and he was eliminated. My policy, our policy is clear. We are continuing to strike Hezbollah with full force, and we will not stop until we reach all our goals, chief among them, the return of the residents of the north securely to their homes. So, notable developments there. Benjamin Netanyahu, some of the diplomats clapping, some of them walking out as he was speaking, including the Saudi delegation. Iris, uh, Reuters this evening saying Benjamin Netanyahu, quote, will cut short his trip to New York, returning to Israel. What do you think we can read from that? I think we can read that there has to be a preparation uh, for some kind of retaliation and, and Benjamin Netanyahu can't do that from New York uh, and so he must return. Uh, you know, th these kind of strikes where you think um, as a military organisation you're going to target someone, they're, they're targets of opportunity. You know, if there's intelligence, uh, they strike once they're given an authorization to do so. So I don't think this was planned for days uh, and that Benjamin Netanyahu knew before he set out. But now that he does know, uh, and now that the possibility of retaliation from Lebanon and from Iran are very real, and of course from uh, the Houthis in Yemen as well, you know, they did fire um, an intercontinental ballistic missile into Israel yesterday. It was intercepted, but nevertheless, they are a player as well. Uh, uh, that that possibility means the Prime Minister must be in the country. So we had a situation just 24 hours ago where diplomats within the UN were saying that they thought Benjamin Netanyahu had agreed to a truce, and now they're saying they seem to have gone back on that. His rhetoric suggests otherwise. I think from the fact that he hasn't ruled out officially a ceasefire proposal, are, are we to say that we're overtaken by events now, Iris, the fact that we are seeing this, uh, this heavy... Bomb, bombing raid, this attack in the south of in Beirut right now? I would say I do feel it's, um, it's an attack of opportunity. You know, there was intelligence and the Israeli military, with authorization, of course, from its politicians, acted. Does that mean that the end game is not a ceasefire? I don't think so. You know, this um, must in the end be resolved by a ceasefire. These are two old enemies who've been living with each other for quite a while, and there are intermittent... Um, there's intermittent actually wars, not just, you know, spurts of violence. Uh, and then some kind of ceasefire is signed and adhered to or not adhered to. Uh, one of Israel's complaints, for example, is that uh, after the last war in 2006, um, Hezbollah didn't go back behind the Litani River, which was one of the terms of the agreement agreed with the United Nations. But leaving all that aside, um, in the end, I think that is an end game. And 
Benjamin Netanyahu's, you know, rapidly changing positions over the past 24 hours before this attack in the Dahya in Beirut, I think is very typical of him. He's always someone who uh, agrees with the last person he spoke to, tells you what you want to hear and plays both sides against the middle. It's a very typical Benjamin Netanyahu game, if you like. Political manoeuvre is a better word than game. And then he continues uh, and keeps both tracks running until he decides which he prefers, the military or the diplomatic, or one and then the other. Uh, so, yes, I do see an end, but this tonight's events are so significant that any discussion about a ceasefire is, is for some way down the track when we see the, the reaction um, from Lebanon, from inside Lebanon and from the region. We, these are live images we're getting now from Dahir as we're talking, Iris, of the scale of the, the damage, the very start of the operation, the rescue operation, to try to find people who are trapped in the rubble and all of these uh, buildings. I just, I'm just interested as well what you were talking about, the Latani River, because this is actually key to the ceasefire here, that governments want a 21-day ceasefire to discuss Resolution uh, 1701. Uh, which helped to end the 2006 war. It's about Hezbollah retreating to that point. Is it, what, 18 kilometres north of the, the border with Israel, Iris? That's right. It is very close, and you might say that most of these rockets can go further, but I think after October the 7th, uh, the Hamas attack from Gaza into Israel, um, Israel definitely doesn't want a militant group, especially one with the power of Hezbollah, uh, closer than 18 kilometres, able to enter the same way and conduct the same kind of attack. Because it had been spoken of much earlier that that was actually a blueprint developed by Hezbollah. What Hamas enacted on October the 7th was a Hezbollah, attack, Hezbollah plan of attack. So uh, that's one of the reasons that that 18 kilometre um, belt is important to the to Israel in its negotiations. But in the end, you know, that's not going to be achieved militarily necessarily either. Yeah. Because let's say Israel forces Hezbollah militarily back up there, then it returns to its borders and then Hezbollah comes back. You know, there has to be an agreement in the end uh, because of the nature of these two states. It's different from Gaza, which is not an actual state. It's, it's a protectorate, if you like. It's a an area, but this Lebanon is a state uh, with defined borders. It's a different issue. Judah, listening to Iris talking about being overtaken by events at the moment. When you look at this and the talk of a ceasefire, is your sense the same that this has gone out the window for now? Well, I, I, I certainly agree that um, it's important not to take Benjamin Netanyahu at his word. Um, so I'm not sure how uh, how sincere he was in, in talking about the possibility of a ceasefire. I think that right now um, there are a few dynamics, um, part, of, part, of, part of which Eris spoke about and touched on. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that, to begin with, Israel is, for all intents and purposes, winning uh, this, this conflict for now. Um, the, the big fear uh, in Israel uh, more than an incursion by Hezbollah is its massive missile, rocket, and drone arsenal. Um, and to date, Israel has uh, continued to sort of cross red lines, uh, expand its freedom of, of, of maneuver and operation. Um, and Hezbollah has really replied and responded with very symbolic reprisals. Um, so it's a sign that Hezbollah does not want to escalate this to an all-out conflict. Um, and I think for uh, as long as Israel feels confident about that, um, th that the Israeli military will continue to push uh, toward trying to degrade Hezbollah's capabilities, uh, take these opportunistic strikes if they can, take out leaders, um, whether uh, Nasrallah or high-ranking uh, military leaders in the group, um, and continue to do that. Um, I think that the, the other thing to keep in mind, and this has to do with the Litani River uh, sort of uh, internal sort of informal border, um, is that, you know, the, the, the 2006 conflict was uh, triggered by a Hezbollah incursion uh, in which they kidnapped uh, two Israeli soldiers, if I recall correctly. Um, I think that's less of the fear 
uh, that Israel has with regard to Hezbollah now, and it has more to do with its military, or uh, its missile arsenal. Uh, but there's a big difference between um, Hezbollah and Hamas uh, post-October 7th, which is that uh, post-October 7th, Israel determined to eradicate Hamas. Uh, and even though that's in, in all likelihood not possible, uh, that, that determination was there. Uh, and the, 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 the Gaza mm. Strip as a, or Gaza as a territory is much more easily controlled and controllable, even if it could be a long-term occupation that Israel doesn't want. Yeah. I don't think there's any illusion uh, among the Israeli military that they can eradicate Hezbollah. So ultimately, the conflict in the north has to end with a ceasefire sooner or later. Yes. Whereas in Gaza, the Israeli military and the, the Netanyahu government has not accepted a, a post-conflict coexistence with Hamas. No. So I think that ultimately it will end in a ceasefire. The question is, how far will Israel try to push in terms of degrading Hezbollah's capabilities? Yep. And ultimately, how, how much Hezbollah is willing to take before it responds in a way that it certainly is capable of, but has not been willing to so far. And the point you quite rightly make very clearly, we're talking about a huge organization militarily, Hezbollah compared to Hamas, and yet Hamas, whilst the Israeli military say that for the most part operations are finished, well, they haven't in terms of the guerrilla attacks from the tunnels, attacks from the fighters from Hamas going back in. If you're dealing with that, with Hezbollah, with what, 100 50,000 missiles, support coming in, 400 to 700 billion, depending on different analysts from Iran every year. That's an altogether different structure. And see the main title here, how to stop an all-out war. When you have Benjamin Netanyahu, pressure from Western allies to say ceasefire, but perhaps the pressure, more importantly, is from the right wing of his coalition, the likes of Ben Gavir uh, and Smotrich, the right wing who say, continue, don't agree. Yeah, I am not a Middle East expert. I'll just put that right out there. But I have spent a good amount of time looking at the ways in which Benjamin Netanyahu and his governing coalition have been trying to shore up their own power internally. And this looking at it goes back to the efforts at judicial reform. I hate using air quotes, but that's the word that they're using. What they're what they're several point plan has been has been essentially to hollow out the Supreme Court, uh, weaken the judiciary and vest more power in the executive. Now, that strategy, which they started working on uh, 18 months ago or so, uh, led to widespread protests in in Israel and uh, even led to some reservists saying they would not take up their, their commands, their positions, as long as this issue remained um, unresolved. There's been credible reporting that said that Hamas took a look at that and decided that since the government was distracted by having to deal with the judicial reform in the protest, that would be a good time to strike. Um, who was benefited by the judicial reform uh, movement? Obviously, it was Netanyahu and his position within the governing coalition, which is why it is so astonishing, but on the other hand, perfectly understandable, that now, while Israel is at war for its very existence, mm. and hostages are rotting in Gaza, and he's opened a new front, no matter how long it lasts with, with, with Hezbollah, that, that Netanyahu and his governing coalition are reviving the efforts at judicial reform. It keeps the focus on them, it keeps their domestic enemies on the back foot, it distracts attention, from what's really going on, which is that the Israeli government is prosecuting at least a two-front war with absolutely no end game in sight. Very interesting listening to Anne as to where this could go next. Elizabeth, when it comes to earlier in the week, we had the French government with the US government, a real positive sense that there could be a consensus around a ceasefire. The words being used by Washington were breakthrough. Do you feel like, particularly with the Elysee right now, that's given events we're seeing, that's gone flat? Well, um, from a French point of view, uh, those images are rather terrible. Uh, what's going on in Lebanon, especially because France and Lebanon have got uh, historical links. Mm -hmm. There are more than two, 20,000 uh, uh, French people living there. And uh, Emmanuel Macron has been personally involved in uh, what's going on in Lebanon. He, Lebanon. he went there several times. He named a special envoy, Jean-Yves Le Drian, uh, two years ago. I think he went five times there. And he really didn't get anything. And Emmanuel Macron, uh, strong words 
at the National Assembly um, uh, of the U uh, United Nations on Wednesday night, it was, was uh, there cannot be, there must not be a war in Lebanon. And mm -hmm. there is, obviously. And he tried anything he could uh, to, uh, to prevent an escalation from the October 7th. He, he really I had uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, every uh, other day on the phone, and he really tried anything he could, but uh, apparently in vain for the moment. Iris, a quick word from you, just listening to Elizabeth. I'm very hard to predict. I don't like to ask you this question, but sometimes you have an insight which helps guide the way, which is, are we likely to see a ground war in the coming days? Uh, that's an interesting question. I don't want to throw my hat in the ring definitively. Uh, there has been all the pressure for action has come from the military. It was the military that said the focus had to go north. Uh, it was the military that, that carried out that um, intelligence operation with the exploding, uh, f first of all, the pages and then the walkie-talkies. It's been the military that's been talking up a ground offensive. But you know, just because you talk something up, particularly in an Israeli context, doesn't mean that it happens. That might be a message to Israel's politicians who aren't behind it. Uh, and, you know, the results so far, I've just heard a couple of politicians earlier today reminding Israelis of the price um, it paid in its history for being involved in Lebanon and going in in a ground offensive uh, and, you know, 18 years of, of fighting there at one stage. Um, so I don't know that they would necessarily begin a ground offensive, which is uh, to the benefit of um, Hezbollah and not so much for Israel, much more dangerous for Israel, while the airstrikes are at the moment proving effective. Iris, thank you. Well, it takes us to events here in France. In the New York Times on Thursday this week, this was the headline. Giselle Pellico has become a feminist hero in France and for campaigners against sexual violence worldwide too in a horrifying mass rape case organised by her own husband. It's week four of the so-called Mazan trial, named after the village at the foot of the Mont Ventoux in Provence where the retired couple lived and where Giselle was drugged and raped by strangers without her knowledge as she lay unconscious over a 10-year period. This week, the testimony of another group of six to seven men on trial. There are 51 in total, those identified from the footage Dominique Pellico had recorded of them. More than a dozen have pleaded guilty. Some deny it was rape, arguing they had their husband's permission, that they thought the wife was pretending they've said to be asleep. Well, Dominique's already pleaded guilty to organising strangers to sexually assault his wife via a chat room. Against her knowledge was the name of the site. Men from surrounding villages aged 26 to 72, including an ex-fireman, local councillor, plumber, prison guard, journalist, nurse. It's a case that's moved people deeply to support Giselle and her decision to lift the right to anonymity. In the words of her legal team, shifting the shame felt so often by victims to the shame that should be felt by the perpetrators. And dozens have waited for hours at the entrance to the court in Avignon every day to show their support as Giselle walks past in front of a wall of camera crews. Qu'est-ce que vous ressentez quand vous voyez ces femmes Beaucoup d'émotions, monsieur. And let's begin with you, a journalist with a legal affairs background and somebody who's followed this case closely. How do you see this case and why it's resonating, particularly on a huge scale? Well, it's, it's interesting. Um, you, you, I, I have been in this business long enough to see many, many cycles of... Um, a society that is shocked and horrified at violence wreaked upon women, especially by men in power. And then there's usually a, a feeling that this will change things, everything will change now, and then it doesn't. And then there's another cycle that comes after that. You can, you can start with Dominique Strauss-Kahn just recently, going in, in, what was that, 2012, I believe, 2011, going on to um, Harvey Weinstein, and, and, and moving on through other accusations uh, against, you know, other proof against other powerful people, the, um, it, it doesn't seem to move the needle. There seems to be less of a feeling that, in cases like that, it's about a power differential rather than um, you know, just horrific brutality against women. This case 
actually, according to the commentary I read, has the potential to change laws in France in a way that some of these more high profile cases did not. And one of the reasons for that is it's taking place in, on the public stage. Not only are we seeing the trial, we are also seeing the evidence. Maybe not actually seeing the evidence, but that there's lots of it. Um, uh, Dominique Pellicot took video of, of the rape, so we are seeing what this is about. That, I think, is galvanizing people to say, this is not something that happens in glamorous settings with, um, with disputed he said, she said evidence. This is clearly what happened. I think another reason that this has the potential to change laws, and there are a lot of people who have suggested that the outcome of this should be a new wide-ranging law in France governing the, the investigation, the prosecution, and the uh, treatment of victims in sexual assault, is that these were not famous people. These were, these were not people you can hold it as. They were ordinary people. In as fact, you, he was called Monsieur Tout Le Monde, that he's been nicknamed mm. Mr. Mr. Every, Every Day. Mr. Every Day. It, they ranged in age from, as you said, from 22 to 80. They, there was a journalist, there was a police officer, there were people who worked in the local bakery. People can relate to this case in a way that they probably couldn't, in some level, relate to some of the more high profile cases. And then, of course, there's the figure of Giselle Pellicot, you know, the courage, the dignity that she brings. And I think that that affects, it has affected not just women, it has affected a great number of men. Wasn't there recently an open letter written by men? A 200? But 200 French. signed by 200 yeah. French men that supported a change in the laws and supported the uh, issues that were being brought up by this case. No, I, I think this is, this really could, be, I know we say this a lot, this will change everything. This case really could change things. You've hit on something that, was a reason why we know so much, and it took Giselle Pellico to decide to lift her anonymity. This is Giselle's lawyer speaking about why she came forward. Giselle Pellico's message is that when you're a victim of a sexual act, you mustn't be afraid to file a complaint. You mustn't be afraid to go all the way through the legal process and not be afraid to confront situations in which you may have the impression that it is the victim's trial. It's interesting, Elizabeth, what Anne was saying. It, Giselle's legal team saying that, and Giselle herself has said that she feels ruined inside, but she's keeping, maintaining a calm, maintaining a dignity. One of the reasons she said she's speaking out is so that even if one other person feels like they are going through this, they are being drugged, sedated, not sure what's going on, that it gives them the power, the knowledge to come forward. Yeah, she's so brave. I mean, she gave strength uh, to her. Uh to everybody, to all the women who felt, or all the victims, not only women actually, we were rather surprised to see the emotion uh, th uh, throughout the, the world around this case. There were many uh, foreign uh, journalists following uh, the case. Uh, we thought at first that it would be just a uh, French story, but as you said, that's ordinary rapists, ordinary horror, and that's what makes it special. And there is indeed uh, an emotion uh, for instance, uh, well, there, are, there have been uh, many uh, stories in the, in the papers. Um, Giselle Pellico's uh, daughter, Caroline, wrote a book uh, that, is being, that is selling very well these days, called, I think, uh, uh, I Will Never um, uh, um, Say Daddy Again, something like that. That's the title of the, of the book. And, uh, of course, this all goes in... A, world um, since Me Too, since uh, all those cases, uh, um, and, and the feminism is, is growing everywhere in the, in the, in the movies, in the, in the, in the courts, uh, in, the, in the streets. Of course, there have been demonstrations to support Giselle Pinico. Um, of course, uh, things are changing all around the world, uh, and, and Giselle Pinico is part of this change, not forgetting that there are things going on in like in Sudan, where rape is so uh, uh, happens so often, and Afghanistan, when women cannot uh, sing, so um, it's things are improving in some parts of the world, and uh, they're not uh, improving in some other parts. Judah in Newcastle, one of the issues here is the fact that Dominique Pellico was originally caught back in November 2020. He was filming. Um, up women's skirts in a supermarket in the south of France. The police then went, um, 
looked at his computer on a file which was marked clearly with abuse. He had tens of thousands of videos and images, and that's why some of these, you know, well, 50 of more than 80 were identified for you just looking at this and listening to the, to the testimony. What, what's your reading of why it's so powerful and whether you, have you heard of another case like this? You know, as, as Anne talked about, you know, Monsieur Tullemont, Mr. Ordinary, and so many people in a, in a village in the nearby area being involved. So I, I, I think that um, with, with every horrific crime against women, uh, each, the, each time there's something unique about it that, that shocks a different sensibility. Um, I'm thinking of the attack in Spain, I think it was five or six years ago. The wolf pack. Uh, by a group that called themselves the wolf, wolf yeah. pack, and they would just pick someone out and, and film it on their cell phones. And, uh, and that caused an enormous amount of horror in Spain. Um, this one, I, I, think that, I think that this case, um, if there's something that's so very shocking about it, it's, it's two things. Um, in any case of sexual violence or rape, uh, the, the woman's agency is taken away from her. Uh, but in this case, the, the, the nature of how that was done is so, the, 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 it's so visibly evident. Um, it brings it to the surface, the way in which she no longer had any agency over what was happening to her and in her life to the point where, uh, you know, we're used to seeing cases of someone leading a, a secret identity or a double identity. Um, this was being done to her without her knowledge. She had a, an entire second existence that she was unaware of that was her victimization. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that the shock of that, the idea that someone could be not only victimized, but victimized without, their, without being aware of it for so long. Yeah. Um, and, and that agency completely and entirely removed um, it was so very shocking. Um, and I think that also sort of reinforces um, the, just the, the, the impact of her decision to open the doors to the trial and to be very public about it. That's her agency. That's her taking back control over her life, over the story of her life, um, and 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 deciding, making a decision. Because that's the thing. She didn't. There was the, no no victim of sexual violence or rape ever decides that. But in this case, she wasn't even aware of it. I think that's the the unique horror of this case. Um, mm. And I think her decision to take agency take back control over her, her story, her life. Yeah. Uh, it really amplifies the impact uh, of what she did. And, and I guess um, just sort of circling back to that New York Times headline, um, you know, I, it's so clear why, why she is heroic and has become a hero. And my first reaction when I saw it too, the, it, nevertheless, was this this sense of the injustice that she had no choice in the matter mm. uh, of of being victimized, uh, but yet she did have a choice over going public, and that's what made her a hero. So um, yeah. again, the, the, this is I don't I, I think we can't expect this to change everything, um, and it may not even change a lot. Uh, because all of these cases have their unique aspects yeah. that are so hor horrifying. To the you're right. At the very least, I just just to uh, quickly wrap up. She has she has closed her story or or, or taken back control over her story in yeah. a way that um, that that is just very inspiring. Yes, in in four weeks of of evidence so far, I think this case is going to continue until December. There's so many. Uh, people, uh, it, so many accused still to give their testimony, as I say, more than a dozen have pleaded guilty. Um, we've learnt that she would be unconscious for seven hours, it would be food that she was given or a drink for dinner that she was served by Dominique, that she didn't know any of them bar one, one person that she'd bumped into in a bakery, that she said that was the only person that she had any uh, recollection of. Iris, just talking about the, the wider scale of this, um, has it reached Israel? Is this something that's making headlines where you are? It's not making headlines, and it's quite interesting because I'm I'm 
I'm what you were months ago when you heard about it, because I only heard about it recently. There's been an awful lot of news here. And when I read it, I was so horrified. I was actually speechless. And I was with an Israeli friend who didn't believe that I was telling him about a real story. It's the facts are so horrifying that this was done to her, that it was done by her husband, that it was done by her husband bringing in other men to do this, to, to rape her, and then that he filmed it, and then that he kept the videos. Uh, and I think this is actually also a crime of social media, because in, let's take 100 years ago, if you wanted to get pornographic pictures, you had to go to a special place, get them in a brown paper envelope, it was all illegal, you brought it back. Here, now, you don't need to do that. You type your darkest desires into, the, into Google or into 4chan or into Reddit, and up they come, and off you go. So... So it's this a group that used to be secret or that you didn't know you were part of a group um, now has the capacity to do to do these terrible things and to do them to women. Uh, and I think, you know, the people who I've been speaking to here about it, some of whom I actually tell this story to, are as horrified as you were when you first heard it. Iris, really, really good points actually you're making there. Uh, we will follow this case. We're expecting it to conclude December the 20th. Meanwhile, here in France, will this week be remembered as the beginning of a so-called government of national unity? Has it brought an end to months of political chaos after the uncertainty of summer's snap elections? Or, as some papers are suggesting this week, is it the beginning of a new chapter of political instability, a government of disunity that will limp on until it's put out of its misery? This picture here has some commentators bringing out the lettuce. Remember this in the UK, the XPM Liz <laughs> Trust lasted six weeks, the lettuce lasted longer, where well, the French Prime Minister, Michel Barnier, can stay in post longer than the average shelf life of a lettuce. Yep, that is being spoken about here in France. Well, Monday, changing of the guard in full effect. Outgoing cabinet members said goodbye, incoming ministers saying bonjour or reintroducing themselves. It's a cabinet skew to the right of centre, only one left-wing politician after 39 appointments, despite the left-wing alliance coming out on top in the vote. Anyway, the new interior minister setting out his very clear aims. The first, re-establish order. The second, re-establish order. The third, re-establish order. Because I believe in order. Order as a condition for freedom. When there's no order, freedom is under threat. OK, so the new uh, French interior minister, Elizabeth, the echoes of Tony Blair when he came into office in the UK over across the channel when he talked about three priorities, education, education, education. This time, it's about order, perhaps the conflation of immigration and crime. Mm, yes, uh, Bruno Rodaio is using words that uh, the extreme right national rally could use. That's the thing, and that, uh, that's really uh, astonishing people. Bruno Rodaio is one of the few ministers that are known to the French people, along with maybe Rachida Dati, the minister, minister of culture, uh, and he's really chosen a uh, tough uh, uh, position, um, to say the least, uh, and he was, there, there have been uh, many reactions from the left who, who are uh, outraged, um, and there have been some comments even inside the presidential camp or inside the, the, the government saying, well, oh, is it going to, to be that far? to the right. So that's the first steps. We've, that's the first days. And uh, we'll see what's, we'll, it will be fragile. We know it's, it won't be easy. Uh, um, and the National Rally is going, has got the power with uh, his uh, 140 uh, MPs to uh, over, overthrow the government or vote laws or no. So that's not going to be easy for Michel Barnier. Hence why Jordan Bardella, the far-right leader, was talking previously about being putting Michel Barnier on watch, that the fact they do have this power to, to see what's going on right now. It's very interesting, Anne, as well, at this time, because Elizabeth talking about you know, the opening of, of the government, setting out its stall. As you follow this, how thin is the ice that the government's skating on right now? Um, I have to admit, I am astonished at how strong... The, the strength of the actions that Macron has taken uh, ever since calling the snap election, making the deal 
with party making the deal with the left to make sure that the national rally didn't get enough strength in the second round to be able to form a government, and now turning around and saying, well, I'm now going to hand over the reins to a center-right prime minister who is going to make nice with the national rally. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how thin it is. Uh, I, I would not count out this, this new European strongman, and I suspect that it won't be very long before the politicians on the other side of the ocean are referring to him in the same breath as someone like Viktor Orban. He's Macron a very, or Michel Barnier? Well, Macron has already shown his, his chops there. Barnier is in the position that he was in when he negotiated Brexit. He has to make everybody feel as though they are part of a grander plan. Um, he, he did a pretty good job with Brexit. I am not a French political um, expert in the same way that Elisabeth is, but I would put my money on him using all of his bargaining skills to make sure everybody stays on board. But it is difficult to make a bargain with the national rally. As we know, they have an agenda. They push it relentlessly. And even though the head of the party, Marine Le Pen, may make noises about modifying and softening her positions, we know where that's gone in the past. Judah, I'm interested in your thoughts. We, we haven't got much time, but maybe 30 seconds or so. But I do want to pick up on what Anne was saying there, that perhaps he can last longer than a lettuce, Michel Barnier. Has he got, as Gen Z call it, main carrots to energy to make this work? Well, I, I definitely think he's going to last uh, much longer than a lettuce, and I agree with Anne completely. Uh, to begin with, the National Rally has no interest in uh, unseating him because, for now, he's essentially putting into practice their program. Uh, and Marine Le Pen and the party have a corruption trial that's coming up that's going to occupy a lot of their attention. Um, so I think, for now, they have no interest in, in unseating Barnier. I think what, what, what I'll be most interested in watching is uh, how uncomfortable Macron gets, uh, because in the past, uh, someone like Retailleau, if he sort of wandered out a little too far off the reservation, uh, everything was, was run out of Élysée, and uh, Macron would just uh, call him to order. Uh, I'm curious to see how the, the sort of chain of command works with Barnier as prime minister, because I don't think he's going to be too interested in having Macron micro micromanage at the cabinet level. Yeah. Um, so in any case, uh, I, I, I certainly think Barnier is going to last a lot longer uh, than people mm -hmm. are, are expecting him to. Um, but I think the tensions might come from uh, within the government and the tensions between the Macron's faction uh, and this sort of hard right faction that, uh, that has essentially been incorporated into the government. Okay, uh, more so, than uh, from the national rally, which for now has no interest in unseating Barnier. A relatively uh, positive tone. Uh, Judah, great to have you on the programme. Judah Greenstein in the UK. Elizabeth Pino, as always, thank you. You'll be back soon because we have, will have developments, no doubt, All right, on the you. French government. Anne Bagamarie, thank you as well, as always. A delight to have you on the programme. Iris Mackler in Jerusalem as well. Thank you. Great to have you with us this evening, as always. Just to mention, it has been a week as well this week. Coldplay have been announced as the most played British band this entire century on streaming sites. According to analysts, Britain's favourite song is Viva La Vida, played on average by an average person apparently 27 times a day, accounting for 400 million seconds of airplay, edging out Queen and take that. So if you're one of those playing this song 27 times a day, it's your lucky day here for the 28th time on us. See you next week.